All right, so electrophoresis is one of the techniques that's used to analyze samples of DNA. So the way it works, you basically start with a gel slab, in which this picture is sort of representing. Um, if we look at it kind of at an angle, it would something, look something like this. This is like a gel slab. And these little holes here are called wells. And the wells are almost like little baskets, and that's where you put your samples. So you could put DNA samples in these wells, um, and then you could analyze them. Now, the basis for how it works is once you load your samples in the wells, you would put your gel into what's called a, a buffer chamber, and there'd be liquid buffer floating around, which is kind of like a saltwater solution. The idea is it's a solution that conducts electricity really well. So here's my gel now placed into this buffer solution. And it's sort of sitting here on a, on a tray. And then the next thing that I would do is I would plug this into electricity. So there would be a, a negative electrode at one end and a positive electrode at the other end. And it's really important that my, if we're doing DNA here, that my DNA samples are at the negative end because DNA has a negative charge. And like charges repel each other and opposites attract. So what's going to happen is if I put my DNA samples in these wells, as soon as I plug this into the electricity, the negative charge is going to repel the DNA, and the DNA is going to start to travel through this gelatin towards the positive electrode. Now, how is this useful? Well, the thing is that DNA, DNA um, is going to travel towards the positive electrode, but different pieces are going to travel at different speeds. If you think of this gel as having little holes in it, little, little microscopic pores, small pieces of DNA are going to go through those pores really fast, sort of like a really skinny, small child running through an obstacle course, and they can fit through all the little holes, so they're going to move very quickly. Whereas a bigger piece of DNA, a longer piece of DNA, is going to be heavier and bulkier, sort of like a big giant person trying to get through this obstacle course, and it's going to take them longer to get through the holes. So in essence, what you're going to end up with at the end of this are distinct bands, that's what we call these, of DNA at different locations. And we can assume that these, these closer to the positive end are lighter pieces, and the pieces closer to the other end are heavier pieces. Um, usually what you would do is you would have on at the end what we would call a standard. A standard would be one that we're comparing it to. It would have bands that we already know the size of those pieces. So maybe this is 100 and this is 90 and this is 80. And then we can compare our DNA sample to the standard and we would know the size of the pieces. So for a sample, here is at the top of my screen here, this is supposed to be a DNA sample. And my DNA sample is 100 base pairs long. That's what we're pretending. And if you add up all these individual numbers, this is just the size of these little segments. So this is 20, this is 70, this is 10. If you add all of it together, the entire DNA is 100 base pairs long. So if I was to take a test tube that contained a sample of this DNA, a whole bunch of pieces of this DNA, um, and I took a sample of it and I put it into one of the wells, and then I turned on my power, assume this is my negative end and this is my positive end, and I let this run for, let's say, 45 minutes, I would end up with a single band of DNA. And it probably wouldn't travel very far because it's 100 base pairs long, which is really pretty heavy. So we're going to mark 100 all the way back here by our negative terminal. Now, like I said, in real life, what they would do is they would have um, what's called a standard. I can make that over here. Let's say this is my standard. And the standard, after it runs, it has pieces of different sizes that we already know the sizes of those pieces. So this would be 100, this would be 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, etc. And what we could do is then we could look at ours and we could go, oh, it went to the same distance as this 100 piece. It must be 100 base pairs long. So that's how we could analyze using a standard to figure out the size of different pieces. However, for, for what we're doing right now, we're not going to pretend like we don't have a standard. We're just making up a scale, and based on where we know these different enzymes cut the DNA, we're estimating where they would be. So we said that if we didn't cut the DNA at all and we let it run for 45 minutes or whatever, we would get one band and it would be, wouldn't travel very far. Now, let's say these letters here represent enzymes, enzyme A and enzyme B. These are what are called restriction enzymes. They cut DNA at specific spots that they recognize. They're called recognition sites. 
So let's say that we add to our DNA sample in our test tube, we have our DNA in here, and we add to it some enzyme A. Well, enzyme A cuts the DNA specifically in this one spot. So now if we take that DNA sample, it's going to have a bunch of pieces of cut up DNA, and we load it here into this well, and we let it run for 30 minutes, here's what we would get. We would get, since A cuts the DNA into two pieces, a piece that's 20 long, and a second piece that's 80 long, 70 plus 10, because we're not cutting it with B, we're just cutting it with A. So it would just like be taking a piece of scissors and cutting our DNA right here. Even if we had 10 pieces of DNA in there, all 10 pieces would get cut in the same spot. And basically what we would get is several pieces of DNA that were exactly 20 base pairs long and several pieces that were exactly 80 base pairs long. So when we run this, we would get a band here at 80, and we would get a band down here at 20. So this would be our piece that's 20 long, this would be our piece that's 80 long. And even if we had several pieces of DNA, if they were all 80 long, they'd all travel to the same exact spot. Now let's say that instead of cutting our DNA with enzyme A, we're going to cut our DNA with enzyme B instead. So I'm going to kind of erase some of the mess I made here. All right, so this time I'm cutting my DNA with enzyme B. Well, enzyme B only cuts the DNA, according to this, in one spot right here, which means we're going to get a piece of DNA that's 10 and a piece of DNA that's 90. So if we cut our DNA with enzyme B and then we put it in our a well and we let this run, we would get two bands. Uh, we would get a band that would be all the way back here at 90, this very big band, and then we would get a band that would run all the way, I don't have 10 on here, but it would run all the way down to 10. So we would get a completely different um, map here. We'd get different band pattern when we cut the DNA with enzyme B. And now in our last one, let's say that we cut DNA with enzymes A and B. Well, if I cut it with A and B, it's going to basically like taking a piece of scissors and cutting both spots, A and B. So I would have a piece that's 20 long, I would have a piece that's 70 long, and I would have a piece that's 10 long. So I would literally get a band here, here, and let's see, 10 and 20 here. So I'd have my 10, my 20, and my 70. I would have three bands. Now, how does this work for analyzing D DNA samples, let's say, in a person? is, let me show you a picture of one. See, your DNA is unique. So you could use this for like paternity testing, crime scene analysis, uh, looking at your ancestry. Basically, if I add enzyme A to three samples of DNA from different people, enzyme A is not gonna necessarily cut those pieces of DNA in the same spot because everybody's DNA is unique. So maybe it doesn't cut my DNA at all. So maybe person A, enzyme A, doesn't cut them at all. Person B, maybe it makes one cut, and it makes a 60-40, um, so two bands. And maybe person C, when, the, when enzyme A is added, maybe it cuts it twice, and you end up with a 10, an 80, and another 10. And so each of these people would get a unique pattern. It would be unique to the person. Technically, everybody's DNA, um, they don't exactly analyze all your DNA in an electrophoresis. I'm, I'm kind of simplifying it, but in essence, that's the idea, is that restriction enzymes, these enzymes, they cut our DNA, but they only cut where they see a target sequence, and depending on the person, each person's target sequences are different. Your DNA is going to be similar to your parents. It's going to be similar to your siblings. It's going to have some things in common with your ancestors, um, but it's not going to be identical to anybody. So if we look at this picture, we have blood from a crime scene, and then we're looking at our seven suspects, and you'll notice that suspect three, their band pattern matches the DNA at the crime scene. And so they could identify that that blood from the crime scene matched person three, and probably not anybody else in the world. It would be unique to that person. So that's sort of how DNA um, electrophoresis works. Here is one more practice problem. So here we are again. So this is what you're going to see on your test. So um, first, draw the negative and positive um, poles. So DNA, you always put at the negative pole, and positive would be down here. If you were to put your DNA on here backwards and put your DNA at the positive pole, it's still going to travel to the negative side. 
So, I mean, towards the positive side. So what it's going to do, your DNA would literally go the wrong way and it would run off the gel. If you were to leave your gel on overnight, your DNA would go the right way, but it would just keep going. And it would also run completely off the gel into the liquid. So you, you have to run an electrophoresis for a short period of time, like 45 minutes, 30 minutes. It just depends. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a scale. Now for this particular DNA, the whole thing is 500 base pairs long. So I'm going to make a scale with 500 as my biggest number, and I'm just going to do this and make sort of a scale. You always want your biggest numbers near the top because that, remember, big pieces don't travel as far. So the common mistake people make is they start their scale with smaller numbers and go to bigger because it makes sense. You know, you normally count up, obviously, but the idea is our scale is representing the distance that our DNA pieces traveled, and our biggest pieces are going to be all the way back near the original wells. Okay, so if we, um, if we take our original piece of DNA that has not been cut at all, we put that in a well, what's going to happen is after our 30-minute period or so, it's not going to have traveled very far. So I made um, my 500 back here, so I'm going to make one band where I estimate to be about 500 base pairs long. Next, let's say I cut my DNA with A. Now this time you'll notice that enzyme A cuts this piece of DNA in two sites. That's fine. Enzymes might cut. It might cut mine twice. It might cut yours three times. It might not cut anybody, somebody else's at all. But what will I end up with? Well, if I cut it with enzyme A, it's like taking this, like a piece of string and cutting it with scissors. I'm going to get a piece that's 100 long. I'm going to get a second piece that's going to be 300 plus the 80, this whole distance. And then I'm going to get this little piece that's only 20. And so if I take this, you'll see I have, uh, I'm going to draw in the bands. I'm going to draw a band at 100. I'm going to draw a band at 380 with this, the big piece here. And then a band down here at 20. Now let's say I cut the DNA with enzyme B instead of A. Well, enzyme B, you can't really erase all of this, but enzyme B makes only one cut and it's right here. So I would get this one piece, which would be 400, and then I would get this piece, which would be 100. So if I cut it with enzyme B, I would get a band at 400, and I would get a band at 100. And finally, if I cut this one with A and B, it's going to cut it in each of these places. So I'm going to add up, I'm going to have all of these pieces. So that's the idea is all I'm doing is I'm cutting my DNA into pieces. You'll know for one thing you're doing this right. It should always, all of your pieces when you draw them in should add up to your original number because you're not losing any pieces. All we're doing is we're taking something, a long piece, and we're cutting it into smaller pieces. Putting all those small pieces together, it's still going to add up to the total amount. And so this is the band pattern that you would see for each of those scenarios if we cut this particular piece of DNA.